Hi there. Welcome to the next episode of Seeking Voices of Health, Healing, and Hope. I'm your host, Dr. Monica Agarwal. As many of you know, I'm a preventive cardiologist, a researcher, I'm a mom, a wife, an athlete, and a patient. Over the years, after getting sick myself and after taking care of so many people, I've heard so many voices of sadness and fear and so much struggle. I decided to do this podcast to bring out those voices, voices of struggle, but also voices of overcoming, of hope, of redemption, and of power. Uh, thank you for tuning in. My next guests are the dynamic duo, Jane Esselstyn and Brian Hart. Jane Esselstyn is a lovely human being who I've been lucky enough to call my friend. She's a skilled nurse, a researcher, a mom, and a teacher on the forefront of the plant-based movement. She and her mom, Anne, have been actively involved in bringing the world energy and love through food. She's the host of the annual conference, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease for Women, which is focused on the power of plants that I myself have been honored to speak at. Jane is an avid and inventive designer of Plant Strong Recipes. She's the co-author of the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook. She's done recipes for, and the, she's created the recipe sections of Plant Strong and the Engine 2 Seven Day Rescue with her brother Rip. And she has a new cookbook coming out that I hope we get to talk about that focuses on plant-based warriors, which is super exciting. Brian Hart is the founder and executive director of the Esselstyn Foundation, which is a nonprofit with the mission to eradicate lifestyle-related diseases through whole food plant-based nutrition. Brian's a highly experienced educator with over 25 years of experience as a teacher, administrator, advocate for school change. He specializes in collaborating with educators to help, help them create immersive hands-on programs He's worn so many cool hats, he, wilderness EMT, plant-based chef, teacher, middle school principal, carpenter. And if you haven't seen his cutting boards, they are amazing. And I have one on my kitchen counter right now. I'm honored to have Brian and Jane on this show today <clears throat> to talk about so many things and to talk about hope and healing. Welcome, Jane and Brian. Hi, Monica. Hey, Monica. Hi. Hi there. Thank you, so, thank you much. so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. And that was such a nice introduction. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's always, you know, I get, I feel like I, uh, I feel like you are family. And so I, you may not feel that way, but I do. <laughs> and I just always want to, uh, I always think about how, when we used to actually come in person to conferences. I always remember coming over there and sit in front of the fireplace and just chatting. It's such good memories of those times in person. I know it seems like a previous um, life, like a previous life. It just, yeah, COVID is, I keep saying the things are BC, like before COVID. And um, that, yeah, I love that. I loved having you, you'd come in you have your hoodie up and you just be doing a little yoga after a big day of presenting and talking to people. It was yes. lovely. It was so lovely. Oh, I know, but it's coming again. I have I have full confidence that we'll get back to that space and um, and we will go back to those great conferences. And you know, you're doing them virtually, and they're equally fabulous. So you know, you bring your energy. Surprise! It's amazing how well you've been able to bring that energy into a virtual space, which I think is a is very hard to do. So I thought we would start with the, some questions, uh, you know, that I thought of, and I thought we would just sort of go from there because I have so many things I want to ask you, and I think people would love to know about you guys. Um, and so I thought we'd start about start out with, um, and you, you know, whoever wants to speak, however you guys want to pipe in, is fine with me. Um, so I was thinking about you guys, and I was thinking about the many roles and hats you've worn. And I was thinking, well, how do you think of yourselves? Like, how would you describe who you are? And how would you kind of describe each other? Um, I'm curious about that. And I'm also curious about your marriage. And tell me a little bit about those things. You want to go well, I see Jane as a incredible bundle of energy. Um, I mean, I, I married a, a, a free spirit. I, I married a person with, with who was, sees the world as, as uh, with amazing potential. So I think in, in many ways, 
I'm, I've always been a little bit of a glass half empty person and I married a, a person who is the glass is always bubbling over. It's always full. And that's uh, one of the reasons I fell in love with Jane. And uh, I, when I met Brian, um, I mean, I met him, I, it's such a funny circumstance, but anyway, I uh, definitely met somebody who I was like, oh, he is funny. He is edgy. It's a little dark. And it was kind of, had that sort of like, there's something alluring about that. Like he, um, he always seeks complexity. He seeks complexity, and um, maybe that's making make, making me feel really shallow <laughs> to say that. <laughs> but um, it's it's a nice compliment. I mean, sometimes when your compliments have plenty of conflict or, or crashing together, but it is a nice compliment and. It's something that we have definitely had leaned on each other and need each other over the 25 years of being together. That's right. 25 Actually, 27 years. of being together, 25 of being married almost. That's right. And that's, that's so lovely. I love how you, the first where you went to was to comment on each other. What about, how would you describe yourselves? Oh, how would you describe yourself, Monica? <laughs> that's not, I'm not on camera. You're the one I have to ask. <laughs> I get to ask the questions. Oh, I, you know, it's, that's hard to say. I think that people always say there's such consistency to personality and stuff. Okay. Let I me change the question. What if I asked you, how do you, which title do you see yourself most as? Title? I, I, don't, I don't have no idea what I do. So I can't, I don't have a title. A motivator. I, you're a human motivator. Oh, oh a title like that? I don't yeah. know. Really? That sounds yeah. annoying. No, I think that sounds good. I think that sounds pretty great. I, I mean, I, I think that that's a really nice hat to wear. Okay, well, then you're a thought provoker. Yeah, I mean, I've always seen myself as an educator. I mean, that's kind of been the one thing I've glommed on to over, over my years of doing whatever I've done, is I always feel like I'm, I'm in it to educate people and to help them transform their thinking in ways that that um, makes them see the world in a different way. That's the way I've always seen myself. And every year, Brian, I mean, Brian, when he was for 20, whatever, decades and decades, he was in education and, you know, you get your curriculum going and you know, people would do the same curriculum for like 16 years. Brian every year would change it instead of having like the eighth grade kids do like talk about um, like, uh, what's, I can't think of, I'm not a hymn song. Give me the right word for Mahatma Gandhi paper. What was the it was the like nonviolence, for example, people, he would, he wouldn't go with the, just talk about Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi. He'd say like, let's talk about Che Guevara, like really pushing the parents and the students mm -hmm. to open their minds and like, Hey, this is not just in the acceptable little cultural terms we can understand. Let's go further. Let's go deeper. Let's think about it in more, you know, with more complexity, which I loved. I love. Um, so does he continue to do that now, 25 years later? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a there's a there's an aspect to me that's always been a bit of a provocateur in terms of trying to get people to think differently, and I think that it sort of lends itself to what I do now, which is work with the Esselstyn, Esselstyn Foundation to try to get people to think differently about food. So I think that's always been a kind of part of who I am. Yeah, I mean that's the thing I know about you the most, actually. Um, I remember the first time you picked me up in Cleveland. It was like eleven o'clock or something because my flight was late. Everybody was asleep in the house, and it was just you and I driving home on these roads in your Subaru, and and we were just chatting about podcasts and about ideas and about history. And I remember thinking this guy is awesome, and I I just remember thinking that there were just so many, you know. I always describe people as an onion, you know, there's just so many layers, right? And so it's, but in the world right now, we only see the social media outside layer, but, you know, I think there, there's, it, I think that part of wanting to do this was also to kind of look at those other layers because it's, they're full of perfections and imperfections and uh, so many different um, jagged edges. And I, I think that that's what's cool, but I do like that dark edge. My husband is also a little bit sassy, a little bit fun, fun, spunky, and I like that. I always like somebody who calls me out and makes me think and doesn't let me, doesn't let me get away with things. Yeah. And, and then Brian's been great with that for me, for sure. Um, and I think my closest friends are like my closest girlfriends are the ones who can be like, Jane, what were you thinking? Like they, they just push it back at me and I'm like, oh my gosh, they aren't just like, 
they aren't these yes people like they're it's not henchmen but they're they're you know they're like they they see me they love me all of me and they're like well that's a true friend that's, yeah, that's, that's a, the definition of a true friend i think is yeah. somebody who can who can make you better by pushing you along and challenging your thinking sometimes and i think jane and i've always kind of done that for each other i think and but when you're saying about the onion though i think you're absolutely right like we are all the core of who we are is somewhere deep within and we layer on all kinds of falsities or, or insecurities or worries or false bravado whatever it is that we layer up with i mean we we do it all uh, subconsciously unconsciously protectively or for whatever reason but it is bizarre how social media just spits out this incredibly curated um almost manufactured so like I, I always try to put just my mom and me up on my social media like we have no makeup no hair dye no nail polish i'm not none none of the i don't know sort of visual cultural trappings or whatever and we're pushing out plants and that's an easy thing to get behind because we really believe in it. And, um, but I, but that I think that's so hard. You know, I think it's not <clears throat> like when I think of social media, I, you know, I have a social media presence that's small, but I, I, uh, when I think about it, I, you know, I, I look and then I put something out there and I just put it out there and then I start scrolling. Right. Mm -hmm. And you start scrolling down and start looking at everybody else's social media. And you think, wow, that person, even though, you know, even though that I know logically that, that everybody's got multiple layers and issues, it's hard not to look at that outside layer and comment or judge, isn't it? You know, like, sure. and so how do you, how do you work that out in your head? Because what happens, I think, to so many people, and this is what's happening to kids, isn't it? Is that they're seeing these outside layers of everyone. Oh, this person went to the beach or this person looks so pretty in their bikini. Or, it's, and, it's destroying, and how did, their, they're destroying their identities. It's just it's destroying, destroying their, their identities. It's destroying their, it's during their emotion, their core, their ego. Um, Isn't that why Facebook had to go to trial recently? Just like mm -hmm. Instagram is literally destroying the sense of identity and selves of especially females. And anyway, um, so I, 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 I wanted to just comment that about social media definitely being something bizarre that's out there. But I also know like there's a positive part to it. Like it does get this message out there that we are really excited about and we lean on it hard to do just that. And people, I think that we don't get too much pushback in a negative way because we're not pushing too much of a, um, of a, you are who you are. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think that, I think that's the key is to maybe just put it out there and have be yourself. And then also not sort of try to feed into the other um, the other experience, uh, other people's feeds and sort of get so caught into it that you forget, wait, there's a lot of depth to this person um, and there's more to it. And I, I think that that's something that I'm trying to teach my kids because my middle, um, Maya is my 13 year old, has been begging me for social media and I have said no. And I don't know if the answer is to say no or to, because, like anything that I've taught, everything in my life when I've, I've parented, I have always told them that they get to help and weigh in in the decisions, even when it came to plant-based eating, et cetera. I mean, we, I, I've told stories before where when they were six years old, we would eat plant-based at home and they'd go out and order chicken fingers and I would say nothing. And, and what's neat has been the process that's happened through that is now at 13 years old, she's she eats no uh, animal products at all, but that was something that she has come to with the process and education. So shouldn't I use that same mentality when I talk to them about social media? So I myself am in my own conflict and confused on how to handle the situation because I want her to be able to figure it out herself, but I don't know if the uh, the biases that come at 13 year old, are we strong enough at 13 years old to not be impacted by so many of those things we're seeing i don't know the answer to that that's a great question it's a great question and i love that you're holding hard because you'll never ever regret delaying that ever 
<laughs> I do get a lot of mom, everybody see, everybody has this, everybody has that. So it is, it's interesting, but I appreciate that. So I really liked the way you described yourself as a motivator and a provocateur, um, a thought provocateur, because I think that those are accurate and, and neat um, ways to describe yourself. And I would think, and I think are very true. What do you think, like, what do you see yourselves and I, I, what do you see as your mission right now? What is your goal over the next, say, 10 years? Oh, well, I think goals become apparent. And somehow we try to live in our day to day to day, you know, moment by moment doing stuff, especially like I, I don't have, um, I'm not working, you know, running office hours from eight to five every day with cardiac patients. Um, we, I live, I have more of a job that's in a creative space. Um, as far as like we create YouTube videos and um, we have events that we put to, put on and we're a part of. And um, like I know my mom and I have a book coming out in August, uh, this August coming up. If I may just do a quick, can you like say the title? Yeah, one? go for it. It is Be a Plant-Based Woman Warrior. Live, live fierce, stay bold, eat delicious. Oh, so I love that. Absolute tip of the hat to my mom because she, when my dad came home in 1980, blah, blah, whatever that was, and said, okay, we're not eating any dairy, any meat, any oil, any salt, any sugar, any of that. And she was like full-time job teaching middle school girls English and four kids and no whole foods, no internet. She's like, okay. And as Brian says, she like just turned on her heel and went to the store and, and made it happen. My dad can't make toast. He can't do anything. So um, he, so the fact that she did this and has continued to do that and she has picked it up and she's gone forward with it since 85 or 83 or 80, 80, whatever this. So that's almost 90. Oh, it's almost a whole long time. Yeah. It's amazing. Anyway, so, so this is a really, this book is a tip of the hat to her for all that she has done and continues to do in this plant-based space. Um, and with energy and forward lookingness, like I think I definitely got a chip off of her block as far as energy and, and you know, capacity to hang in there with this message. And um, what's astounding is you can continue to create all kinds of recipes. And I mean, I guess there's this false food in this plant-based space. Now I say false food, but you know what I mean? Like impossible burgers and then yeah. uh, one beyond, uh, meat. beyond, beyond meat. stuff, beyond, beyond meat things. And um, so, yeah, so our book is coming out and it's really exciting. And um, I hope that we have uh, some. Yay. It's going to be very exciting. So it's, it's you and your mom together, you and your mom have put it out together. Yes. yes. So, and, so, and the next 10 years. So I just see that, like, I see how from 40 years to now, this whole plant-based movement went from zero, like, or not zero, but, you know, very, like, there were some like vegans in the woodwork, you know, <laughs> you knew about some of these people, like yeah. very hippie kind of almost harkening back to like a Woodstock kind of a hippiness yeah. to being completely culturally normalized and in every restaurant and or, you know, most cities that have some level of variation or sophistication, not to sound judgy about it, but they have all kinds of plant-based options and so what's going to happen in the next 10 years? I think it's just going to have this acute rise. And I sort of see what we do becoming less and less significant in a way because it's going to become so normalized, which is what ideally most doctors do is they try to put themselves out of having a practice to having no, having no patients. So that's a weird thing to say about my own work, but I think, but you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm meaning yeah. it's, it's a positive way to look at maybe a negative yeah. this outcome right or, or what, sure. what, what's there's probably some term oh, sure i mean the thing is people people talk about so you know the well as we focus more and more on health you're right it's becoming more mainstream isn't it there are more people that are talking about it um we're seeing as you pointed out the foods everywhere that are more plant-based and maybe not the healthiest but they're at least plant-based and um and we're seeing doctors i mean it's it's now we're in this actual interesting shift in medicine because we are seeing so many people that are coming through and that are becoming nutrition specialists and but what's happening is um is that even though people are doing so much nutrition focus or at least are educated 
they still are having trouble as physicians and as as healthcare providers we're still having trouble educating people about it because the focus in and healthcare still right now is acuity based care isn't it so you know the more acute or sick the patient is the more you bill um the more you send to the hospital for procedures the more money the hospital makes and so we as physicians that focus more on nutrition and prevention and lifestyle actually make patients better and that's actually bad for business um and so that's a sad reality to sort of think through but hopefully over over the next 10 years, I'm hoping that the shift is going to be away from acuity based care to value based care. And there's going to be that shift towards more focus on the emphasis of prevention and primordial and primary prevention. And so people are going to really start focusing um, at least uh, at least payers are going to catch up. And so all of a sudden. Um, healthcare providers that offer healthier options are going to be celebrated more than they are. Yeah. Exactly. So, I, I totally hear you. I totally hear you. And um, that is a vision I want to just jump on the back of that broomstick and ride right through it with you. Yes, <laughs> I know. It's it's amazing. I mean, it's it's um, it's still not there. I mean, I was talking to a prominent cardiologist in this area um, who is the chief of the division, and he got called into the office of his um, his senior. And the, his senior person asked him, like, what's up? Like, where are the patients? Why, are, why is the stent volume going down? And um, the doctor said, well, the stent volume is going down because people are actually getting better. And that sort of is like, huh, you know, like sort of step, have to step back, like, wait a second, because, you know, that's what we're, especially as cardiologists, we are, our interventional cardiologists often make the highest salaries of the bunch. Um, and, you know, the number of stents they put in or procedures they do make their salary, um, yeah. which is That's sort so of a sad thing. Yeah. yeah the, so like, the where are the stents? Yeah. The incentive situation is completely backwards. Right. Yeah. It, it, how, how do we how do we change that is incentivization what's the right word i'm trying to say right. yeah no it, you're right so that's the big question and i think a lot of what we're trying to show with studies now is that there's going to be if we start focusing and showing people that prevention works and that you actually can improve people's outcomes then payers are going to start watching and they are starting to you know there are things like medicare advantage and there are programs now that are available that are in are incentivizing health, the health of a patient rather than uh, the sickness of a patient. And that's the key, right? Emphasizing the health instead of the sickness. And yeah. it's that whole shift that we need to work towards. So I think that's an, a great goal. What about you, Brian? What would you say your goal is? Well, in, in my work with the foundation, as you said, our, our mission is to prevent and reverse lifestyle related diseases. We would love to put ourselves out of business as any nonprofit mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. would in trying to meet a need. Um, I don't see that happening anytime soon, um, just considering the statistics that are around, you know, that 600,000 people die a year of heart disease in this country, over 600,000. Um, but is that really the number? Yeah, 600,000 a year in the United States die of heart disease. So, um, so my 10 year goal would just be to continue to, to get our information in front of people. I mean, that's we, we judge our success at the foundation in terms of the number of people we we are able to preach to in a year. Last year, it was about 2,500 people we were able to present to over the year. Um, you know, it was so exciting. We just, he just presented to the, what was the, the residents? The family practice residents? Family practice residents were so excited about it in the- Oh, that's middle, wonderful. In Connecticut, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, Middlesex uh, Family Health yeah, in sorry. Connecticut. Yeah. We've That's just, awesome. Yeah, so we've been trying to present to medical professionals, um, people we call community influencers. We're, so the next 10 years, I really see us, you know, just a, a continuing to, like this year, our goal is to present to five, to 5,000 people, um, which is a lot. You know, you can't unhear what we say about plant-based eating and whether you come, come into it now or maybe when you get sick later or something, we can't unhear what we say. So that's that's what motivates us over the next 10 years is just to continue to push this message out as I'm sure you know the goal for you is probably pretty similar you just want to keep preaching 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 and 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 getting more people to hear the message I, I like that what do you think though like how do you do it you know how does one 
motivate a person to make a lifestyle change? And this is something that I find to be a fascinating question because when you're healthy and when you don't feel sick, you it's harder to change because you're like, yeah, 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 I'll do that later or I'll get to that. Um, you know, and unfortunately with heart disease in particular, um, <clears throat> you often don't get a sign or a symptom. Like if your blood pressure is high or you're diabetic until it's end stage, you often don't feel it. And so how do you motivate somebody? And so often I see patients in my clinics who've actually had a heart attack, who've had a bypass, um, or have been told they have a diagnosis of something and that's what makes the motivation. Well, how do you, how are we to tackle 20 year olds and 30 year olds and get people to get motivated? Because I will tell you when I was 20 and 30 years old, um, I would say, you know what, I'll do that later. I got to focus right now on getting through medical school, getting through my training, getting through this, getting through that. And I'll worry about that later. But we, as we all know, second pregnancy, getting through my third pregnancy, like you kept putting it off, love. I remember your story. Ooh. Yes. And so if that's the case, if we keep putting it off, um, how do we, how do we tackle, like, how does one motivate a person and how do you feel like, how have you worked on that? Especially as a, as a Brian in particular, like you have worked with kids and younger people. How do you find, and what do you find motivates younger people? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I think the, the triple threat for me is what motivates young people and I, and it's health animals and the planet. And so I always think of it as like this triad, um, when you're trying to get, when we, we presented recently to a high school here in Cleveland and we, we did it live actually, which was interesting. In that but, pocket in October when things seemed okay before yeah. Omicron. Yeah, before Omicron. And so, um, that's the way we approached it because every young person, um, even though they don't realize it, they care about themselves, they care about their health. And for a lot of them, obesity is an issue. So that, that speaks to them. You talk about animals and animal welfare, which a lot of young people today are very interested in animal welfare. And then the third thing is the planet. You know, the climate change is very real for this generation. And, um, and it's something in the forefront of their minds and something they worry about. So that's the way we try to motivate younger people. But you're right. I think it's very difficult, especially somebody who doesn't know that they're sick. And as Dr. Esselstyn will remind us through some of the studies that he quotes in his presentations about how um, in uh, autopsies that were done on young pe any young person who's died by, you know, accident, homicide, suicide, he'll remind us that, that there are, there's gross evidence of, of coronary artery disease in a lot of young people these days. Um, and so just trying to help them understand that though they might not think they're sick, they are, uh, they're, they're ahead in that way, at least, um, and to make it about them, because we, as we know, all young people really care about is themselves, and it's just part of their developmental stage. I think if you can make it about them and their own health, um, but then also layer in that planet and piece and then the animal piece that gets their attention. We had a lot of really, we had a lot of success with the presentations we did at this local high school mm -hmm. because of that. Um, it's something very, that's very real for them. And some so of them- what would you, go ahead, sorry. No, no, so I, and I, I, it's funny. I, supposedly the motivator, feel like there is absolutely no one answer suits all. There's no, there's no one approach that fits all. I think- the motivation only happens from within. Like you cannot motivate anybody to do something unless they want to do it. Do you, kind of, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. So, but that being said to his list of three, somehow with kids, I think every person sort of identifies with themselves having an athlete within or being an athlete or being an active person. Like some kids, it might be just dance or maybe even just, I want to feel good in my body as a young person because they haven't not all young kids are like morbidly obese or have the disease state. So a lot of these kids caught on to the athletic mm. aspect. I mean, they were ninth and 12th graders. You only got the teeny weeny little like prepubescent to the, you know, fully grown. Some had, cub. some had a babies actually. So, uh, so these kids were the whole spectrum, but they had, they all responded. There was something about, um, when we talked about athletes. It was a little bit quieter in the room. And ourselves having three kids who are plant-based and like our daughter just got a bunch of national records last week Yay. Um, at, at NCAAs. So division three, and it, it, it's, um, it's, uh, that's another little motivating factor. But I honestly think that from working with adults, I, I've, I hear from people and feel from people that there's not one thing that motivates. Some people are there because they're 
they somehow have didn't die from their first heart attack. So they're motivated from that like skillet to the head of, you know, oh my gosh, I'm so sick. Some people feel the, the knocking on the door of diabetes and they just are so sick of medication and they're swollen and they're immobile and they are so tired of it or they want to lose 200 pounds or, and so at our immersions, what I do, like when I mean immersions, I mean in our one week uh, long um, rips, my brother rips company called plant strong hosts these week long immersions. I just do one day events. But what I've found is that at all the breaks between the lectures where you're sitting on their bums, we just put on music and I just sort of, I bop around the room, not doing my line dancing like I do at my events, but I just bop around the room to, you know, whatever song it is, you know, Marvin Gaye to, to Madonna, Madonna, who cares? Marvin Gaye whatever it is. Yeah. No. Just, but I just, I just shake my tail. And I don't care. I don't care that I'm just walking around, moving around. And I look, you know, behind me, it says I'm walking, I guess I don't stand still and dance. That's a little threatening, but I walk around. By the end, there's this trail, train behind me and some in front of me of people just walking and moving. And honestly, getting back in your body seems to motivate people. Like some people end up just coming up to me and say, I never thought I would dance again in my life. And I've danced all week long. Like there's something about this young person inside that, you know, again, go back to that, like not an athlete, but that mover of a body inside, like owning your, from your toes to your nose, owning your body. But how do you do that, Jane? And, and I just and shake my like, tail. Yeah, no, no. But how oh, do you, oh, sure. And I love that. And I, I always love, you know, I also uh, love, you know, I love the events. I love being around because everybody's dancing and it's so fun. And and I think that that's such a key part is that you make it, you make the events so much full of so much joy, but how do you, do you, um, how do you keep joyful all the time? I mean, like, no, people are not joyful all the time, but you are always joyful. Like what's up? That is as I, as I'm, I'm 56 and 55, I married a younger man. <laughs> Ooh. Um, and I, I honestly, every year of my life, two things have become really clear to me. Like I am completely lucky that I was landed in the family I landed in and that my, I get along with my parents and my siblings, we all get along like that. Yeah. We have like, eh. but it is not every family's story, every family's culture or every family's way. And I just feel so lucky about that. And I only, only can hope that we can give that to our family of creation. And <clears throat> second thing I'm always daily aware of is I wake up feeling vitality, feeling interest in the day, feeling like I want to have the music on and a little bit of a tail wagging going on. Like that's just, it is, it is just, that's the default. I'm totally capable of feeling things, you know, beneath that or hyper or whatever, but vitality is a go-to. And I think that energy breeds energy. And it's really easy to get stuck in, in this rut. And COVID has thrown all of us. I know it's thrown our household and into like a two-year rut of not having a lot of uh, chances to go out and be a part of a, a concert or a, a, the community or feel safe in, outdoor in the swimming pool in the summer. I mean, it's just, it's been wacky. I mean, you're in Florida, which is just a rebel without a cause, it seems. Um, and, but in the parents next door, you know, we've been sort of high, uh, hyper, hyper vigilant, hyper vigilant. You've been, you've been not, vigilant. High, not a hyper, but like, yeah, just vigilant. Really, vigilant. really, really aware of, of, uh, kind of what we do is also them. Oh, sure. So, uh, so it's been, a, it's been a tough two years for that sense of vitality at times. Um, but I think you've chosen, like you wake up every morning and you say, I choose to be joyful. I choose to appreciate and be thankful. Not really a choice. It, 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 it is, it's like, you know, when you have a song in your head, you don't really consciously put the song there. It just looks like there, like in the middle of the night, I'll wake up and go to the bathroom. And sometimes I'm even, I'm singing like my oven, like the timer is done song, like do, 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 whatever, but you're, I think she's got too much serotonin, Brian. I don't know what's going on. Like what I is going up, on? I wake, I wake up and I'm like, okay, I can do this and this and this, and then I'm going to run. And then we're going to have this for dinner and, and just like wake up moving forward, moving onward. Like I signed my letters of and emails like okay onward with plants and love and each other and I truly believe that like 
that's been my favorite message to everything is like what about you brian though would you say you have that same energy and vitality all the time not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I'm no. not. A, I'm not a morning person. I'm. Uh, I'm not a morning person. Yeah, but um, no, I have to. I have to motivate myself. I tend as a as a former history teacher. I think it's um, it's you know when you spend a lot of your time in in your career looking at a lot of the mistakes of the past, which I think is what history, <laughs> history teachers do. You're, you're really trying to look at a lot of human tragedy and challenges and, and those types of things. I think you come at things from a little bit of a darker place. And so I think, um, you know, I think, and one of the reasons, like I said at the very beginning, one of the reasons I think I was attracted to Jane early on when we first met was that she was so positive. And, and so I, I think often when we seek a partner, we seek somebody who's a little bit of our opposite. And so I think that was definitely true of, of the coming together of Brian and Jane is that, that I was looking for somebody to balance me out a little bit because I tended to come from things as, like I said, a glass half full or half empty, sorry. I don't think we totally knew that though. We didn't really know that. No, yeah, we didn't really know that initially. But anyway, I think um, I definitely- So how do, you, how do you motivate yourself? Like how do you bring the joy into your day? Like when you're in a rut or you feel down, like how do you, what do you do to bring yourself up? That's a great question too. Um, I think little, little steps. I think that action, as Jane said, action breeds action and energy, and breeds, energy. energy breeds energy. And I think that, that by taking it one step at a time and making little micro moves in the right direction, I mean, sort of to the atomic habits point is that um, if you can just move the needle a little bit every day and and recognize that you've moved the needle and that can mean in, that can mean in your own mood but it could also mean in the work that you do i mean how do you not i mean sometimes i ask myself you know how do i not get down in working in this plant based movement because it is interesting because a lot of people don't really don't want to hear the plant based message and we're really pushing a boulder up a hill and trying to get people to accept this plant based message so how do i not get down and the work that I do. And I think the answer is you just got to think of the one person maybe who you influenced in the day that you've been on this earth and hopefully you've moved the needle a little bit and that's going to ultimately give you hope and motivate you. Does that yeah. make sense? It totally does. Do you think, and sometimes I've considered that the reason that it's that we go into these ruts is because we have so many expectations on ourselves and, or maybe you have so many expectations on life for instance, Jane's, you know, day, she's okay. You know, she wakes up in the bathroom and goes to the bathroom and she says, okay, you know, she's thinking about the song. She's thinking about her run. She's thinking about what she's going to cook for dinner. And that's a very, uh, it's a very in the present moment kind of feeling. Whereas I might say, you know, gosh, you know, this didn't, isn't taking off as well as I'd like it to, or I haven't done all these charts or I, you know, and so maybe, maybe the problem is we expect too much from ourselves or and maybe do you think that that's something you suffer from i i think so absolutely i think i agree um yeah expectations we all have these high expectations for what our day should include and then then you layer in the social media piece right if everybody's out there on social media talking about all the things they're accomplishing in their day and the amazing run they took and the incredible coffee they had with a friend or whatever they're bragging about it makes it even harder because if you look at social media at all you're constantly forced into this comparison of what everyone else is doing. So yes, I, I think that's absolutely true. You know what I loved? We, um, our kids go to, uh, I, I can't say small, Kenyon College and Williams College. We have two kids at Williams. So we get all these emails about stuff and they sent out this um, <clears throat> email at Williams, which is, I, maybe you know of Williams College, but it's like the most competitive liberal arts college, uh, college in the country. It's the oldest, it's got all these like grand things about it. But anyway, they had this post that, that they they put it back up because it was in the alumni notes and it said we got the most response to this person's email and it was this person who was alum from probably i don't know probably 12 years ago i mean not like you know a long just you know she's just recently out and trying to like I don't know, meet early 30s she's like um i just want to say i'm not living the, my life to my fullest. And I, I, I'm stuck, kind of stuck at home. My career hasn't taken off. Actually, I don't have a career and I'm we're trying to get pregnant. And just like things were all going south in her. She's like, I feel like 
I look at all my classmates and what they're up to and I feel lost and hopeless. And does anyone else feel this way? It got the most responses from any alumni post ever. This is exactly the song sheet we need to be singing off of at times. Like life is hard. What can we do? Let's, how can I talk to, how can I connect, circle the wagons or not feel alone or isolated in this stuff? Like, and I, I mean, I'm so glad that we stumbled upon that because I suddenly was so proud of yeah. this person and the college for posting it again, oh, like nice. pulling, up, pulling out the chat wall and putting it on their newsletter. And so it's, so it's because it's that honesty, right? Oh. It's that honesty with uh, the way that maybe we, maybe social media prevents honesty or, or we make it easy not to show the honest side. Or maybe we're always taught to put our best foot forward. Uh, and so we're always trying to present ourselves as sort of more than we are. Um, yeah. And then we forget, for instance, I have had uh, three miscarriages before I had my first child. I got, it was one was so far along that I thought I was gonna die inside. I was so down. Um, and um, I had, when I got rheumatoid arthritis, I thought, I can't tell anybody about this because I can't let anybody know that I have this weakness, right? And so like you, it's this, these parts of us, like that woman at this college was showing all her weaknesses and her insecurities and her, and we're not so good about that. And that's, and that's but, your, but thing. your story has been so strengthened by you sharing that vulnerability of what happened with your RA. And this woman got such, I guess, positive feedback from being vulnerable and showing that great and so so important and so important to uh share the maybe the ugly side um and because the ugly side is the real side so much of the time and um as you point out yes i uh, i have been uh surprised to see how it was taken in the world where i thought people were going to judge me for having an illness uh i was embraced and so maybe that's what you we forget, like you forget over and over again, and then we just get back into that trap. Um, so it's just interesting to think about. I want to shift a little bit to back to that motivation question, because I'm thinking about those kids and about uh, kids and people who come in. And um, and when you're working with people as, as part of the Esselstyn Foundation, I want to know, like, what are the few things, like, what would be like three things that you would tell people who are like, look, I'm not going to change. Like, I like you, you're nice. It makes sense, but I'm, I'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy. Like, what are the three things that you would ask them to try to motivate them to change? What would you say? And what would be like the three things that you might say to them to make simple changes, um, to make impact? Or maybe you would say, you know what, there is no middle ground. Uh, you just got to change. Like, how would you handle that? Well, I think incrementalism is important. I think that for some people, change, drastic change is just not something they can do. And so I think you, unless you always need it, unless it's absolutely needed. But um, I think that's really important to stress with people is that little changes lead, lead to bigger changes down the road. We've been talking a lot more openly about something called 90-10 with the Esselstyn Foundation. Like if someone comes up to us and says, look, I don't want to give up animal products. I want to still keep them in my life, but I'd like to eat healthier. And so we often say, okay, well, what he about- He says, I have a hard time saying it. <laughs> yeah, I, what about 90-10, which is 90% plant-based, 10% you know, animal proteins, um, which really means two meals a week, two meals a week of eating animal protein of some sort, you're probably going to get a lot of health benefits because really, I think in life, we often talk about things we have to give up, but really what we should be talking more about are the things that we gain. So in a plant-based diet, we often say, oh, well, you have to give up meat and you have to give up dairy and you have to give up added oils. What if we flip, flip the message a little bit and said, well, look at all this stuff you're going to gain on a plant-based diet. You're going to get all those phytonutrients and all these minerals and vitamins. Um, and to think more of it in this terms of abundance than in terms of giving up. But um, I think that's good. That's a very important point. Yeah. And people have responded and said, you know, hey, I loved your, the Esselstyn Foundation work and all your messages. And like, Anne and I are such, but just, blah, you know, balls of, I don't know, too much sometimes. But when Brian gets on there and, and he says, you know, 90, 10, and we're in the background saying, we don't agree. But he's like, forever is a long time. So go ahead and just give this a go for a week or two or whatever. And if you need to do this or that, like, 
it's fine. And you know, I, I like, I think that's maybe the best. I love that forever is a long time is such a great sentence because um, it's not sort of, you have a, it's okay to take time to get there. Right. And so uh, I'm also a race. It's not a race. I, I'm also comfortable in the space in the middle. Uh, I'm okay with good enough sometimes. Uh, I'm okay with that because I would take good enough over nothing. Yes, exactly. And, you know, and, and in terms of like what sort of incremental changes should they make, one of the first things we always talk about is oatmeal for breakfast, just to put it in really basic terms. If you can switch your breakfast to, to, to having oatmeal every day versus some nasty, you know, eggs and bacon or whatever you're having, white toast, donut and coffee, donut and coffee, yeah. you know, that's a huge incremental step. Um, the other piece that I often talk about um, is bowls for dinner, you know, just if a couple of days a week, you can have a, uh, you know, a gra grains, greens and a legume, kind of like a Chipotle style, you know, integrate that into your into your week. That's a huge step in the right direction. Um, you know, those are the types of incremental changes we talk about all the time um, because they are going to make things better. I mean, especially considering how fiber deficient most oh. Americans are. Um, you know, if you can just get a little bit more whole grain fiber into your diet, oh my gosh, it's going to make a huge difference. So, so again, incrementalism is is key. Even though we don't straight out preach it in the beginning, we talk about going cold turkey and the importance of that, trying to get your taste buds to readjust. Um, People will push back on us and say, I can't make changes this fast. And so we say, well, okay, you can't. So let's, let's do what you can do. Um, that's what, that's what health coaching is all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love that. I, I really do love that because I also, I live in the space in the middle as well, as I said. Um, and I, um, I do have, I'm okay with, I'm okay with the messy middle. And yeah. I think that, you know, everybody's got to sort of get there on their, in their own space and in their own time. And I, I like that. I like that message. And well, we always hope um, to get to the end. I love that forever is a long time. I love that. That's a great say. That's a great yeah. thing to say. And 90-10 is, is, if you really think about it, the 90-10 approach to plant-based eating probably is the most realistic in terms of really getting all the benefits of plant-based, but still maintaining a little bit of animal protein in your diet just because you don't want to give it up. I mean, that's... that's See, there it is. There's a little rebel. There's a little rebel, the little like provocateur like, yeah. You can do a little bit, but also in that you can, you can do a little bit of a 90, 10. Can you do the 90, 10? Cause it's a slippery slope. So it's like giving you freedom, but like you are, you're driving it. So. Yeah. And I think that's what people want. I think people want control and autonomy and a, the ability to be able to um, make some choices. And, and, and people often say, well, you're taking everything away from me. Um, and I often will say, well, first of all, I, I, I hope that I'm not taking anything away and that you are making these choices for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second thing I say is that, you know, I'm not, I'm just taking, I, I'm thinking of, stop thinking about what I'm taking away and think about what you're gaining, as you have pointed out, that there's so much more to focus on than what's being eliminated, but rather what's being added back. So, you know, some really good points in there. I love them. So now I have a question for you about uh, aging. So, you know, we're all aging. Mm -hmm. um, and so how is, how do you feel, how is life in your house now that kids are starting to move away? Um, like you have two in college, right? Three. three. Three, all three in college. Gosh, I don't envy your bills. Um, <laughs> but, but I, how does it feel at home? Is it lonely? How does empty nest feel? Does it feel like, is it a thing? Do you feel it? How have you kept yourself um, present in each other's lives? And because I will tell you, my husband and I, who I adore my husband, we hardly see each other half the days because, uh, oh, can you take this one to this one? Can you take this one to this one? Like, how do you, uh, when, when they all left, was it really lonely? Like, how did you keep the connection? How well, did we, you keep vital? We had, we had three in a row, really, they're like three years apart. So like one, two, three, they left. And um, one of our kids went away her junior winter semester to the mountain school, which is up in you know, Vermont. And it's just this wonderful, like live in the woods kind of 
throwing type semester. Um, so we had a little practice, but one of our friends said and said, said, we're not calling this empty nest. We're calling this free birds. Like we can really do what we want to do. So, and in a weird way, um, like I got, I got my, my head together around this next book coming out and I kind of got it to the publisher, right. As COVID, as COVID hit right when our senior was about to leave. So it gave me something to do, but it also was like, I thought, oh, I'll have all this time. Here we go. And then I couldn't even go to the grocery store. <laughs> but so in a weird way, I feel like my energy was ready to be at home with us just doing this. And Brian actually took the time. I should let you speak, but he signed up to get his master's in social work, which he's um, you know, slowly chipping away at working on while running the foundation. So, you know, semester here, semester there, it might take six years to get through it, but, you know, education is a wonderful thing and it's never lost. It's never a waste. It's always used no matter what you're getting educated on and working on ourselves has been kind of fun. And, you know, there's been some funk in all of our hearts and heads and minds in, in the last two years, just with like the global intensity of all this. So it hasn't been just cheery, fun recipe testing at all. It's been fearful. What, what are our kids going to do? What is the world ahead for our children who are trying to graduate from college and trying to interact with their friends and their classmates and their experience? And it's nothing like they had two years ago. It's, so it's been some heavy junk. I didn't want to swear on your podcast. <laughs> And, you know, I have to try every single moment when I that not to use them. I have such a potty mouth. So uh, uh, don't don't ever hesitate. But, you know, it's interesting because, you know, there there there's kids um, that are growing up and going to kindergarten and never see children. Right. With because they've only worn a mask and they don't know what it's like to be without a mask. And then there's kids that we know that have had suicidal tendencies while they've been at home in COVID. And, um, you know, it, yes, it's, it's just, and, and it's just, it's this, it, there's definitely so much sadness in this time. And I'm hoping that people are listening to podcasts and listening to people. That's why I really like you guys, be, more than anything we talk about nutrition is the energy and the honesty and the rawness of the, you know, being not afraid to sort of say, you know what, it's kind of hard or yeah, we've struggled too. Or like, what would your message be? What would you try to say to be hopeful if you were trying to say, okay, you know, I'm not sure how it's going to, what my kids, things are going to be like for the future, but how would you, what would you say for hope? And what do you say to each other for hope? Like, it's going to be okay. What do you say? There are, I think the line that's come up recently in our lives is there are a thousand ways forward. A million ways forward, <laughs> says the motivator. There are a million, there are a million ways forward. There are a million forward. ways forward. So whenever we kind of brush up against a, 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 a hurdle of some sort in our lives, whatever it is, with our children, something in their lives. With ourselves. With ourselves. Um, we just have day to remind day. ourselves day by day, there are, there are ways forward. And sometimes the way forward, you never even can, because you get worried about what the way forward is. And then something shows up that you didn't even realize was an option. Cause you just think like, it's, it, it's gotta be this or it's wrong. Like the world has to continue like it used to be, or it's not going to work. Um, or I'm not, am I ever going to get out of this funk? Yeah, maybe you will. Like, just maybe, maybe it's going to be this way or that way. And I don't know. I, 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 lately, it's been there are a million ways forward, day by day. Um, Annie Lamont has a great book called Bird by Bird, which is just you know, it's just it's just taking it like you think you said earlier, just the, the next the next thing forward, step by step. Right? What's the, yeah? What's the next right thing to do? That's always our question. And and to your to your question about like empty nesting, I think. Uh, I think this phase of our lives, if you want to call it the back nine, I don't know why. I mean, we're, I'm 55 and Jane's 56. And I mean, we're not we're, golfers. I don't even, I yeah, don't even we're understand We're not even that golfers. Reference. So, um, but you got to really, you really start asking yourself, I think, at least I have, is really asking yourself about what you want the last part of your life to be like. I mean, you sort of spend the first, could argue maybe two thirds of your life scrambling to sort of make ends meet and raise your children and do all that stuff. And then suddenly they're out of the house and you suddenly ask yourself, well, what do I want 
people to remember me for? What type of work do I want to be doing? And, and that sort of has fed me into like this Esselstyn Foundation and the social work degree. And- I never asked myself that stuff. I'm just like, onward, love, plants, each other. Because <laughs> I mean, gosh, we could walk out to the mailbox today and be hit by a meteor full of COVID and just perish. I think I'm more like Brian and I think more about, um, I think more about um, that in sort of what I want my impact to be. But again, I think that some of that is tricky because it goes back to that expectation thing, which is that expectation of ourself, whereas Jane is just sort of living in the moment more and sort of we could all learn and benefit from that. Well, what are the things for you about that? Like, why do you care what your impact is? Like, I, I'm going to be gone someday and no one's going to know I existed. But I think what you overlooked, Jane, though, is the fact that you're, that most of your life has been about, about having an impact, whether you like it, are you as an educator, as a health person, as a nurse, like, okay, well, I think whatever. it just comes and, nat- I think it comes so, naturally to you. But you have a, I have a glow boy file of all these glowing letters and things that have been written about him, as you probably have a huge glowing file of things. You've made an impact. So back off on worrying about it. And like, you're going to continue making an impact because you're wired that way, Monica. You're wired that way, Brian. You guys aren't going to go into like some greasy day sales or day trading, whatever. I don't even know, don't even know the term for it. I mean, you're going to keep doing what you're doing, but carry on. And it's, you are loved, you are seen, you are accepted wholeheartedly by everyone around you. Like, I think it's based on some anxiety that I don't luckily have and don't try to chase. I think that that's probably the best and most important thing, which is that we need to living in the moment is almost become cliche, but it's, it's, it's not as much that as to say like, oh, well, you, you know, you've done what you've done. You've made impact in your, in your life. And because of who you are intrinsically, you're going to continue to make choices that are like that. Yeah. And then maybe we don't have to try so hard or try to try to be impactful when you're already being impactful um, or why to worry about being or doing when you are already doing. And maybe that's uh, maybe that's the key. And, and the other thing I really like is sort of the million ways to move forward, because it is that is that, you know, even Matthew Haig writes a great book. It's called The Midnight Library. Brian, if you haven't read it, it's fantastic. Um, one of my best books of the, of last year, uh, Matthew Haig, H-A-I-G. And in the story, it, it's, you know, I'm not going to go through the story, but one of the things they point out is, is that, you know, because there's so much, sometimes what we all fixate on besides the future and expectations is also sort of disappointment of what we could have done um, or should have done, or why didn't we do it sooner? And that, that feeds a lot of people's sadnesses. And, and Matthew Haig, brings up in that book beautifully about how, you know, the, you're here and you're always meant to go here. And the path that you take is almost irrelevant because it all eventually gets to here. And I found that to be really, uh, helpful to me, um, because there are times where I thought, well, I think I should have done it this way. I think it would have really changed things, but it reminds us that maybe the course was always going to be kind of the same. And maybe it doesn't matter what happens in the middle if you chose to go A versus B or C. And that really helped lighten things for me as well. Just kind of thinking that we, and it's sort of what Jane is saying too, which is that if you just kind of, you are you are who you are, you're doing, you're always going to do, stop worrying about what's here and stop worrying about what's here and just keep going. I love that. It's because it's not a race. It's kind of like a course. And you're going to just run this course and not, it's not race. It's not time. It's not co- compared. Like Brene Brown has a wonderful thing about what comparison is. And that made me realize I don't compare myself to anyone, which I don't know how that happened, but people are out there comparing, 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 and trying to be better than, but if you're trying to be better than someone you're comparing and you're never going to win if you're trying to be the same thing, but better version of the same thing. So just be your own thing. Like Monica, you freaking rock. Exactly. So you, James. Like, so you, Brian. No, no, but like whenever we are like, we need to, we need someone to come and speak and present and be there and da da da. We're like Monica, 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 Monica. Like you, you are right here in the forefront of our minds as somebody who's Aww. doing a wonderful thing, wonderful job with the tone and the character. There's plenty of people that we're not choosing, wink, wink, who are in a similar. You know what I'm trying to say. You're the go-to because you're doing it the way that 
harmonizes with us, I know. And uh, so just this comparing with other people and thinking there's some place you're supposed to do and something you're supposed to do, you're stop. Because no yeah. one wins, no one gets, you're running your own course. There are a million ways forward in your own course. And you're like you said, you're going to get from here to here. We're all going to die. We're all going to die. And it's okay. Like, it's really okay. And it's just going to, that's when it, that's what this is. He's saying like, we're, we're born and we die. That's what he's really saying. It sounds like, I can't wait to read the book, but from A to Z, it's this, the course is, it's, it's it doesn't matter. It almost, it doesn't matter. And so maybe stop focusing on the end and stop focusing on the beginning and then the, then it won't matter so much. And I think that's, I think that's the, the greatest uh, thing that the, the sign of, or the signature of hope that maybe that's what we take leave from this, because if, if we stop thinking so much about the end and the beginning and the impact and the things we could, or the regrets, and maybe by default, we live in the present and we, no matter how cliche that sounds, we just, because we're not focusing on those other things, we um, are forced to focus on just the piece of the road in front of us. Mm. Um, and I think that that's, I think that's good advice and, and wise and I mean, it's awesome. We're reinventing the, enjoy the view. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. And that's so, it's, it's so true. It's, and it, for some reason, it's hard to do that at times. Yeah. But I think, you know, I put sticky notes all over my house. I'm a sticky note queen uh, and I have little sticky notes all around my room and around my, on my notebooks. Uh, and they say little things to myself and on my mirrors in my bathroom. And so that helps me. Maybe that will uh, help you too, Brian. And sort of reminds me like, oh yeah. I'm not going to focus on this and this. That's what I'm going to put on today. Oh, that's what you drew. I was curious. That was what I was going to ask you is what did you draw while we were on this call? Lovely. Just love and, and this is just like togetherness. Brian did the blue thing in the middle. And I, of course, attacked it with my green happiness. I love it. You guys are amazing. I have kept you over. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, what I admire most about you truly is your energy and your passion and your joy and love, mostly probably of all is the love. And I think that uh, you, it's not just love of each other, which is there, I, your, your love of humanity and your love of, of just um, of the rawness is, is amazing and, and just, just amazing. So I thank you for who you are um, and all the ugly parts too. So thank you so much. Thank you we for being on. Way. We feel the same way about, about you. you. And let's continue this conversation off the podcast, please. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Anytime. I feel like you, we all need to sit in front of uh, at, at a bar with a couple of cups of tea or uh, maybe I'll have wine and you guys can have water. <laughs> you have half, he might have half a beer. He, I'll have half okay. a beer. I don't drink and he's like. That's why I said you guys have water. I'll have the wine. <laughs> Right. Great, great to see you. you. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the time and for the great questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it too. I, I love you guys. Bye bye. Love. Bye bye.